And Jazakallah khairan, and thank you very much, Brother Hafizuddin. He recited from Surah Al-Insan. The opening verse there asks us the question, have you thought of a time when there was, when, when man, when insan was a thing not even thought of? And it goes on to talk about the creation of man and the fact that he was given a choice between believing or disbelieving, whether to follow the path or not to follow the path. And then it talks about uh, the reward in Jannat, the, the features of Jannat, springs and young boys who, are, who, who, are, who live forever, circling around the people who are enjoying Jannat. And, uh, so, and it also talks about, of course, the Day of Judgment, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, it also talks about the, the faculties of hearing and seeing, which have been bestowed upon man uh, for a specific purpose, and that is to make the choice between believing and disbelieving. And uh, somewhere in the middle of the surah, it, it says very clearly that the Qur'an was revealed in stages. And uh, talking about the Qur'an, uh, I'd like to tell you more about today's um, conference, because it's about knowledge, and the Qur'an is a source of knowledge for us. And uh, the, this conference, From Night to Light, as the title suggests, is supposed to illuminate our lives where there is darkness at present. And in Islam, we all know that there is a rich tradition of knowledge, dating back, of course, to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, in the early centuries of Islam, knowledge was something valued very much. And the Muslim scholars of the time were great scholars because they made the effort to learn and to apply what they learned. And that's what led to um, lots of great benefits, like mass exchanges of information, trade, prosperity, the development of culture, education, and of course, dialogue between different communities and civilizations, and graceful discourse. To be able to do all of these things, you have to have knowledge. And that's the reason why we're here today. So this conference is supposed to be a platform for connecting us back to our roots uh, based upon knowledge. And it's also meant to connect the youth in particular. I know that there are quite a few people here from tertiary institutions, um, from NUS and NTU, etc. Uh, and it's supposed to be this sort of thing should be done in a proper academic setting where we're supposed to learn from those who can teach us so that we remember the meaning of knowledge and its foremost position in Islam. And then, so that we can also ask the question, where is it today? Where are we today in terms of knowledge? Are we lacking or not? And if so, what do we do to solve the problem and, and, and remedy the situation? So this conference is supposed to be a, a gathering of youth, of, of the young people and parents, so that we can listen to what our esteemed speakers have to say on the subject. And it's meant to be interactive, and of course, it is an academic atmosphere. I have to now go on to, to welcome some of our guests. So this conference is being held, uh, organized by the al Fazan Education Center. And I would like to uh, welcome our guests from Mu'is, and also from the various madrasas in Singapore, from Andalus and Pergas, and also from the National University of Singapore, NUS, and from Nanyang Technological University, NTU, and all other tertiary institutions which are represented here. And of course, I want to welcome all parents and, and, and their children and, and everybody else who is attending the two-day conference. Um, I have to introduce uh, our speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Taufik Chaudhary. And uh, he is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Mercy Mission. And he started F Mercy Mission through its first program, the al Kawthar Institute, in 2005. And Mercy Mission is one of the fastest growing Muslim social enterprises in the world. Dr. Chaudhary graduated from the College of Sharia in the Islamic University of Medina. He's also a very experienced businessman and is a CEO and has been the CEO of a multinational IT company. He is also a practicing medical doctor in Australia and is also a co corporate trainer and business coach. Dr. Chaudhary is a prolific speaker. He has traveled extensively and he specializes in Islamic finance, personal law and medical ethics. And he's also the father of five children. The first topic, uh, the first lecture is entitled Al-Ilm, Commencing the Lifelong Journey. 
It's a one hour lecture with a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Tafik Chaudhary, to the stage. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka la nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My respected brothers and my sisters in Islam, once Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sitting with the Mashaykh of Badr. Mashaykh of Badr are the best of the Sahaba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once asked Jibreel who, uh, and Jibreel asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the best amongst them. So Jibreel said, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who do you consider to be the best of the companions amongst you? The Prophet sallallahu said, we consider the people who fought the battle of Badr to be the best. And Jibreel alayhi wa sallam said, we also, we the angels also consider the best of the angels to be the ones that fought the battle of Badr. So amazing, amazing people the battle of Badr. So Umar radiallahu anhu was sitting with the Mashaykh of battle of Badr and then he recited a surah of the Quran. Which surah was it? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ فَسَبَّ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابَ When the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and His mercy, and you see people entering into Islam in large numbers, then praise Allah and glorify Him. Indeed, He loves to forgive and He forgives all sins. This is the meaning of the surah that Umar radiallahu ta'ala, ta'ala anhu recited. So he asked the Sahaba, Mashaykh Badr, Ya Shaykh, Ya Mashaykh, what is the meaning of this surah? So at that point, some of them kept quiet. At that point, some of the Mashaykh actually said, this means that Allah's victory is near, Allah's victory is coming. So at that point, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu entered a young boy by the name of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, who was only 14 years old, into their gathering. And he asked Ibn Abbas, Ya Ibn Abbas, what is the meaning of this verse? What is the meaning of this surah? So Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, the meaning of the surah is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is being told that his end is near, that he is soon going to pass away, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take him back to him very soon. Question is, how did Ibn Abbas know this? How did Ibn Abbas know this? At the age of 14 years old, much younger than all the other people of Badr, which year did the Battle of Badr take place? Which year? Does anyone remember? Which year did the Battle of Badr take place? Second year of Hijrah. And if the Battle of Badr took place in the second year of Hijrah, how old was Ibn Abbas at the time of the Battle of Badr? How old was he? Two years old? Three years old? That's it. How would a boy who hardly knew anything compared to the Mashaykh of Badr who were older and who had attended the Battle of Badr, how would he know so much? And the answer is, the answer is, بِلِسَانٍ سَأُولَ بِقَلْبٍ عَقُولٍ When Ibn Abbas was asked, Ya Ibn Abbas, how did you gain knowledge? How did a young boy like you get more knowledge than sometimes Sahaba that were far older than you, far more knowledgeable than you, far greater than you, and had lived with Rasulullah far more than you? Do you know what he said? بِلِسَانٍ سَأُولَ وَبِقَلْبٍ عَقُولٍ By a questioning tongue and by an attentive heart. A questioning tongue and attentive heart. What does that, what does that mean? It means I kept on asking, kept on asking, kept on asking. I asked and I asked and I asked and I asked and I asked. Every time I had an opportunity, I would ask questions. Every Sahaba that I knew, I would go and ask him, what did you hear from Rasulullah I used to wait outside their houses, as Ibn Abbas said. I used to wait outside the house of Ka'ab ibn Malik and, and, and Ka'ab al-Ahbar and other Sahaba. He used to wait outside their houses. At what time? At 3 a.m. in the morning. At 4 a.m. in the morning, waiting for that moment when the first Adhan of Fajr will go off and the Sahabi would wake up to pray his Tahajjid prayer and as he was coming out to make wudu, I'd quickly grab him and ask him a question. Ya Salam. This is how knowledge is gained. This is how knowledge is gained. Knowledge is gained with an attentive tongue. Knowledge is gained with a patient heart. Knowledge is gained with hard work. It is not a bed of roses, my brothers and my sisters in Islam. Knowledge does not come to you. You come to knowledge. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, welcome to our conference today. 
where we talk about the greatness of seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of you is in a privileged position because you've left your homes wherever you live, 10 minutes away, 15 minutes away, and you've come to a place to seek knowledge. And the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever leaves his home in order to seek knowledge, then he has a reward of someone struggling in the cause of Allah. Someone fighting and struggling in the cause of Allah. Can you imagine the reward that you're having? And this is why our Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah used to say that by Allah, today in our time, in the 21st century, the greatest of struggling in the cause of Allah is seeking knowledge. And it's for this reason why some of the great Sahaba of the past, some of the great Sahaba of the past, they used to say, if anyone thinks gaining knowledge is not struggling and fighting in the cause of Allah, gaining knowledge itself is not struggling in the cause of Allah, then he has something wrong with his intelligence. Meaning what? The greatest struggle today, my friends, is not the struggle on the battlefield. The greatest struggle is here, is here today, is here, you and your mind, is here today, you and your knowledge. The greatest struggle, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, is you struggling to seek knowledge of Islam. And I'm telling you, when you seek a path to seeking knowledge, by Allah, the truth will become clear to you how difficult the path is, yet how sweet the path is. You know, there's a type of fruit that is popular in Malaysia. It's called durian. Does anyone know durian? Anyone know durian? Everyone knows durian. I tasted durian yesterday night, or the, the night before actually. Yes, salam. I had to brush my teeth multiple times to get rid of the taste. They say some people love it and other people hate it. I think I'm in the middle. I couldn't make up, make up my mind. But it's one of those things which you are very afraid of. It smells, it's apprehensive, you don't want to do it, but then when you taste it, like subhanAllah, you know what? Allah has put some real blessing in it. Just like the rose that has thorns with it, subhanAllah. Sometimes the most beautiful things initially appear to be the most difficult. And I'm telling you, Islamic knowledge is sometimes like that. Sometimes it looks very difficult. It looks like a real struggle, a real challenge. But subhanAllah, once you taste it, once you learn about Jannah and Jahannam, once you learn about fit, once you learn about Islam, there is nothing like it. And the only thing you can have, the only thing you can have is only more of it. It's a, it's a, it's a thirst quencher that creates more thirst in you in order to seek more knowledge. My brothers and sisters of Islam, my question to you is, how did Ibn Abbas know that إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ actually means, actually means that the Prophet ﷺ will pass away. Do you know how? Because he said, later on when he was asked by Mujahid radiallahu anhu, one who was Mujahid, was one of the main students of Ibn Abbas in Tafsir. He said, yeah, Ibn Abbas, كيف عرفت? How did you know? He said, firstly, this surah was revealed where? It was revealed in the Ayyam al-Tashriq. What is Ayyam al-Tashriq? Ayyam al-Tashriq are the days, the three days where a person stays in Mina after Hajj. The Prophet only did Hajj once, right? In the 10th year. And this surah was revealed in the 10th year, in the last days of Hajj when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mina. Okay, that's one thing. So that is a very important indicator. That's number one. Number two, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a messenger and he is a messenger not a prophet because a messenger is someone who his people fight against. Whereas a prophet, no one fights against a prophet. An example of a prophet is Yahya. Yahya alayhi wa sallam was a prophet of God. Why was he a prophet? Because the Banu Israel accepted Yahya. Banu Israel accepted that Yahya was one of their prophets. In fact, they consider him to be one of the last of their prophets. Zakaria anhu, was accepted by Banu Israel. So he was a prophet. Whereas Isa والسلام, was not accepted by, by Banu Israel, correct? And that's why Isa والسلام, was a level higher than Yahya. Why? Because he is one of the messengers. So the messenger is someone who the people do not accept his message. And a prophet is someone who people accept their message. Both of them have a book. Don't think one has a book, the other one doesn't. No, no, no. Both of them have a book. Both of them Allah speaks to. Both of them Jibreel comes to. The only difference 
is a prophet is someone who the people will accept and a messenger is someone who they will not accept. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu continued and he said that when the people enter into Islam in large numbers, that means there is no more opposition to Rasulullah's message. No more are people fighting his message. No more are people against him. Therefore, there is no longer need for a messenger. <clears throat> no longer any need for a messenger. <clears throat> and it is for this reason why, <clears throat> excuse me, it is for this reason why the surah is a clear indication, clear indication that indeed the Prophet Sallallahu end is near. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing wisdom. بِلِسَانٍ سَأُولٍ وَبِقَلْبٍ عَقُولٍ with a very questioning tongue. Because what was the question that Ibn Abbas had? Ibn Abbas asked the Sahaba, when was this surah revealed? That's all he asked. The other Sahaba who were with Rasulullah in the last Hajj asked him, when was the surah revealed? That was a question. But what he understood from it was amazing. What he understood from it was something which the rest of the companions could not understand. And this is why he is the Bahab al-Ilm. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, there is nothing like knowledge. There is nothing like knowledge. Gaining knowledge is the most amazingly, amazing, <laughs> amazingly beautiful thing that you could ever do. Nothing like knowing when you don't know. Nothing like having eyesight when you're blind. Nothing like having a medication when you're diseased. There is nothing comparable to knowledge. Knowledge is needed by everyone. It's needed by the kings and queens, and it's needed by beggars. Where is money? Not everyone needs money. With all due respect, kings and queens don't need money. They have status, they have pride, they have mansab, they have everything that they need. A beggar needs money. A king doesn't need money, but knowledge is needed by every single person. Knowledge, when you give it, it increases. Money, when you give it, it decreases. And that is why a person who shares knowledge he only gets wiser and he only increases in his knowledge. And this is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah used to say, Kunna nasta'inu ala hifth al-ilm Kunna nasta'inu ala hifth al-ilm bit-ta'lim We used to seek the aid of teaching in order to preserve the knowledge in our hearts. Amazing, isn't it? One of the reasons I'm giving you a lecture is not for your benefit. Actually, it's for my own. Just so that these verses and these incidents and these, these points actually stay stronger in my own heart. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, truly knowledge is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He who is blessed with knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him a great thing. We have not been asked to ask an increase in any single thing except knowledge in the Quran. Nothing else. وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمًا And say, O oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. O oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. No doubt, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, we have only been asked to seek an increase in that which truly benefits, that which truly adds value to our lives. Question is, how do we seek knowledge? And how is knowledge sought? And what are the means of seeking knowledge? Let me share with you what Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah had said in that amazing poetry of his. What did Imam Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah say regarding seeking knowledge? It's very important and this is the only thing you take back from not only my lecture today but from this whole conference. It's more than enough. More than enough. You don't need to take back too many things but this you need to remember. So remember the poetry of Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah regarding seeking knowledge. Ya akhi. لن تنال العلم إلا بستة سأنبئك عن تفصيلها ببيان Oh my brother, you will never ever gain knowledge except by six things. I will explain them to you in great detail. What is the detail that he does? He just explains them all. What are they? الذكاء والحرص واجتهاد والبلغة وصحبة أستاذ وطول زماني Amazing. What did he say? He said, my brother, you will never gain knowledge except the six things. You don't do these six things and you miss one of them out, that's it, mate. Okay, my strength is coming out. <laughs> okay, that's it. You don't have these six things, you're out. Meaning, no more. 
knowledge. So every single one of the six things is absolutely critical. So pay attention to each of these six things. The first thing he said is al-zaka'u. Then he said al-hirs. Then he said ijtihad. Then he said bulgha. Then he said suhbatu ustad. Then he said tulu zaman. What are these six things? Number one is a dhaka, intelligence. Intelligence. You have to be intelligent to seek knowledge. You can't be, quote unquote, an idiot. An idiot is someone who has low IQ. An IQ of 70 is actually a psychological term. I know it's being used these days as a derogatory rude word, but it's actually a medical term in medical psychology. Okay? An idiot is someone who has low IQ. What does it mean by not being an idiot? It means, there's no one here who is an idiot, by the way. So please don't misunderstand that we're calling people idiots. No. What we're saying is, use your intelligence for knowledge. Don't use your intelligence for shaitaniya. Every one of us has intelligence. MashaAllah. Every one of us. Even those people who can't sit and study, they're also intelligent. Look, they're making money on the streets. They've got understanding. You know those people, those businessmen, for example, who've never ever gotten a degree, for example? They're still intelligent. They're street smart, aren't they? So you are intelligent. Everyone is intelligent. But the problem is they're only using it for wrong things. Some people are intelligent so they figure out how to not pay tax. Some of them are intelligent and figure out how to make a business work from something that others can't make work. Some people are intelligent and they actually figure out how to build a rocket ship. Some people are intelligent and they figure out, figure out the tafsir of the verses of the Quran. The point I'm trying to make is use your intelligence for knowledge. Use your intelligence for knowledge. Islamic knowledge before anything else. Islamic knowledge before anything else. Because everything else is futile and useless unless you use it for Islamic knowledge. You know, there was a time when people used to seriously understand the value of knowledge and understand the value of intelligence and knowledge. So much so that they used to spend vast majority of the time seeking knowledge. I wanted to ask you a question, everyone. How many of you work 9 to 5 or 8 to 6, whatever the time is of your office work, every day of the week except the weekends? How many of you do that? How many of you are working at the moment? Okay. All right. So those people who are working, tell me this point. Are you not using the most intelligent hours of your day for work? Yes or no? Are you not using the most intelligent days of your time to make someone else wealthy? <laughs> you are. You're not making yourself wealthy. You're just earning a living with all due respect. If you think that $5,000 a, a month is being wealthy, you've got no idea. You've made 50000 for someone else in that, in that same month. So don't think you're getting wealthy in this way. No, no, you're just earning a living. You're using the most intelligent time to make someone else wealthy. You're using the most intelligent time to achieve someone else's vision with all due respect. If I were to hire you, you're actually making me wealthy. Thank you. Would you like some money? Here you go, here you go, $5,000. Thanks for the $50,000 you made me. See you later. Okay? Believe me, it's true. What am I actually trying to say? What I'm trying to say is use the most intelligent time for Allah. Use the most intelligent time Allah has given you. The time when you're most productive. Right after Fajr. Yeah? All the way to the Asr and Maghrib. When your mind is sharp, mind is strong. And you can study attentively and memorize attentively. Use it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, I am saying that this is more important than anything else. I am saying that. I am saying that this is more important than your job. And I am saying that this is far more important than anything else you're doing in your life. Absolutely. Do you know what Al-Hassan al-Basri said? Al-Hassan al-Basri said, Ya ayyuha shabab all young men and women, I'malu lil akhirah, work for the hereafter. Work for the hereafter. For indeed, I have found in my experience, anyone who works for the hereafter, also Allah gives him the dunya. But I've never found in my experience, anyone who works just for the dunya, gets anything from the hereafter. Allahu Akbar. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? How true is the statement of Al-Hassan al-Basri? 
Look at Imam Muslim, rahimahullah. How great is Imam Muslim? Great, yeah? Imam Muslim was a great businessman. You know how much he used to make? Every month? They used to say Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, from selling clothes in his spare time, and not, you know, he hardly had spare time, but here and there, just before he left from his, from his house to go to the, the class of Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he would just sell here and there. He used to make 100,000 gold pieces of, of, uh, of money every single month. And look at us, miskeen over here. We hardly gain knowledge. We're not, we're not even a, body, a hair on the body of Imam Muslim. Neither has Allah given us the akhirah or the dunya. What's the answer? What's the reason? It's because the one who works for the akhirah, Allah gives him the dunya as well. I remember Sheikh Ja'far Idris, rahimahullah, hafidahullah. He met me once and he said, Ya Tawfiq, do what you love, money will follow. He says, do what you love, money will follow. If you open up how to get rich, think rich, <laughs> think, think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill, right? The most important book ever written, apparently, on American capitalism, okay? Where Napoleon Hill was contracted by Rockefeller to interview 500 of the richest businessmen of America, okay? He interviewed 500 richest businessmen. Then he wrote down 13 rules, qawaid, the principles of being rich, okay? And it's called Think and Grow Rich in his book. The first one he says is, whatever you do, do it with passion. Follow your passion, he says. Follow your passion. It's true. Do what you love, money will follow. Do what you love, money will follow. Subhanallah, my brothers, my sisters, Islam, I'm telling you, you will not believe this until you see the lives of those people who have been working their lives, doing what they love, and by Allah, their risk has been coming to them, and you have no idea how. No idea. Subhanallah. I can tell you a few stories, but inshallah, we'll leave them for later. I've got lots more talks with you guys these two days. So intelligence and zakat, very, very important. What do people do these days? They study when they are actually unintelligent. When? Oh, just before going to sleep, they have the tafsir tabari there, tafsir, no, not even tafsir tabari, tafsir ibn kathir next to the table, and they suddenly open up their verses and, oh, you know, that's it, they're asleep. You hardly even finish the page and you're asleep. Or, bulugh al-maram, bismillah, wa an abu huraira, that's it. <laughs> They don't even finish it. They don't even finish the narrator to read the hadith. I mean, not that bad, I'm sure. But I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, you're so busy, and your mind is so tired. How will you ever gain knowledge? Without intelligence, you'll never gain knowledge. So spend your intelligence seeking the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more I have sought knowledge, the more I gain knowledge, I realize the most intelligent people are the scholars of Islam. The most intelligent people are the ulama of Islam. You cannot find a more intelligent person. Show me the excellence of the memory of Al-Bukhari. Do you know what actually happened with Bukhari once? The scholars wanted to test him. So they brought 10 guys who narrated 10 hadith. Each one of them garbled up the isnad. Each one of them said 10 hadith. One after the other, one after the other, one after the other. Right? And they wanted to test if Bukhari knew what was wrong. Bukhari, then what did he do? He narrated each one of the hadith with the mistaken isnad exactly as they said it. And then he corrected it. Ibn Hajar said in his Fatul Bari, he said, what is more amazing is not that Bukhari knew the strong hadith, the correct way of the hadith. That is not the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing is that at the same time as they were saying the isnad in a mistaken way, he remembered it straight away and he repeated it exactly as they said it. 100 isnads. Oh my God, no one more intelligent than the scholars of Islam. Show me the excellence of the intelligence of a great scholar like Ibn Taymiyyah. Show me a great scholar like him. They used to say, once it was reported, and this is an amazing incident, that Ibn Kathir, that Muhammad bin, uh, bin Abdul Hadi, that Ibn Qayyim, and all the great scholars at the time of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, they all went to visit Ibn Taymiyyah. And al Zahabi was amongst them as well. al Zahabi, great scholar of hadith. All of them sat there. Then 
Ibn Taymiyyah sat on his chair and he gave a lecture for an hour. And then Ibn Qayyim says to Ibn Kathir, he said, did you understand anything? He says, Wallahi wa la kalima. Wallahi, I don't understand a single word he said. He said. Yeah? And that's why Dhahabi says, رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا كَأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ مَوْضُوعٌ بَيْنَا يَدَيْهِ I saw a man who as if knowledge is in front of his eyes and he takes from it wherever he wishes. Ya Salaam. Ya Salaam. Show me the intelligence of the scholars of Islam by Allah and you know what? I, I think that is more worthy of reading. But you cannot. So don't ever think that scholarship is like today's average imam in a masjid. No. An average imam today, unfortunately, is a reflection of the state of the society. They have never studied properly. They haven't, le haven't learned properly. When a person has less intelligence, oh, let him go and memorize the Quran. Let him go and go to the madrasa. It is the most intelligent people that used to study Islam. Not the least intelligent. Today, our society has become opposite. So my brothers, my sister Islam, Truly, if you want to learn about intelligence, then, then you must listen to the scholars of Islam and their intelligence, inshaAllah. Okay. Then he continued and he said, as zakau Then he said, Al-Hirs. What is Al-Hirs? Hirs is focus. Focus on one thing and one thing only. You know, this myth that we can multitask is rubbish. You cannot multitask. It's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And sisters who think that they can multitask, feeding the baby with one hand, cooking uh, the chapati and everything with one hand, and then moving the other stroller with the other. <laughs> okay? At the same time, she's put her phone in her, uh, in her hijab, talking to her, her husband. Yes, Han, how are you? I love you too. Yes, yes, yes. She saying yes to the baby or yes to the husband. It's, <laughs> it's not possible. It's not possible to multitask. We are not made in that way. Females have a corpus callosum of their brain, which is actually a little bit larger than a man's. So there is a perception that females can actually multitask. But the reality is, men have actually very small corpus callosum. That's why we're like, hmm, what? Hmm? We can't. Have we look watching TV? We can't. Why is talking to you? Huh? Hmm? <laughs> okay? So there is a perception that female can actually Take it. But the reality is, there is a huge breaking point. They can only tr give the perception of multitasking for a very limited time. Half an hour, an hour, then she breaks down. Then she stresses. Isn't that right? And that's true. The sisters will all, are they all smiling? I know that they are agreeing with me. Because it's not possible to multitask in that manner. It's just not possible. We're not wired in that manner. Focus, focus, focus. When Steve Jobs took over Apple, how many products did Apple have? How many products did Apple have? Who can tell me? How many laptops? How many desktops? How many devices did Apple have? They had 67. 67. Do you know what Steve Jobs did? He, he called everybody. He cut all of the product line and they made a 4x4 four four table. You know, a 2x2 two two table, I'm sorry. Yeah? Made a 2x2 two two table. And then he said, professional, non-professional. By professional, he meant, you know, like uh, desktop publishers and people who are very tech heavy, yeah? So tech heavy, non-tech heavy, yeah? And high end, low end. That's it. And then he put one product there, one product there, one product there, one product there. How many phones does uh, iPhone have? One. iPhone 4, iPhone 4, yes, yes, mashallah, nice one. Okay, essentially one phone, right? Essentially one phone. How many does Nokia have? My first Nokia was a 6750, and then there was a 6750i, and then there was a 9500, 9700, and then 3250. Oh, is that a 3350? Or is that a 3350i? What the? So who's actually got the biggest market share? Apple. Why is Apple, why is Apple winning and why is Nokia losing? Because no focus. No focus. It's so simple. You don't need anyone else. I'm telling you, I'm a, I've, I've run IT companies. I know what I'm talking about. You focus on something, you perfect it. 
You beat every competitor in that market. That's it. Focus makes you the strongest and best that you can. You know light? It gives you light, right? But light, when you focus it, it can cut through steel. True? That's what a laser is. What is a laser except light that is focused? SubhanAllah, how powerful can it be? Do you know in Saudi Arabia, have you guys seen the marble on the ground in the masjid? Have you seen that? Beautiful, isn't it? Very smooth. So smooth, yes, salam. Do you know how they cut it? They cut it with a stream of water. They cut the marble with a stream of water. Shooting at a 10,000 kilometers a, a, an hour. That's fast. But so fast that water can cut through even marble. Oh my God. Subhanallah. Focus. Focus, focus, focus. What's your focus? What are you focusing on? What's your vision? What are you doing? La ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula mudadzabina bina. You know what that means? It's like a fly where one day here we're sitting in this, we feel like this, and then two, two, yesterday we feel like this. Today we feel like some knowledge, and then tomorrow we feel like night safari. And then after. La ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula. No, 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 it can't. You focus, focus, focus. You focus, and by Allah, doesn't matter what difficulty, just like the laser will cut through steel, just like the water will cut through rocks, you will also be even that one by one, one by one, you will cut through every difficulty and knowledge will enter into your heart. But you have no focus, but Allah, you'll never get it. You have no focus, you'll never get it. Al Makul radiallahu anhu said, he said, I circled the earth in search of knowledge. That's all he did. Ibn Aqil said, for 40 years I traveled seeking knowledge. Abu Hatim al-Razi rahimahullah said, I traveled for 5,000 kilometers, miles, I'm sorry, farsa, 1,000 farsa, or 5,000 miles on my feet seeking knowledge. How much have you gone to tra travel to seek knowledge? Where have you gone? Have you gone to Saudi? Have you gone to Egypt? Have you gone to Jordan? Have you gone to Mauritania? Have you gone to Pakistan? Where have you gone for seeking knowledge? You just come to Masjid al fazan not Masjid al Arauda. That's it. Where have you gone? Oh, I went to YouTube. <laughs> Alhamdulillah for YouTube. I mean, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. At least there's some knowledge still available to Muslimi. But without focus, you cannot. Without focus, you cannot. It was said, it was said that a Shafi, rahimahullah, he memorized the Quran at the age of seven. At the age of ten, he memorized al muwatta He used to memorize in such a way that he used to have to put his left hand on the left page and then read the right first because if he didn't put his left hand on the left page, he might end up memorizing that before the other one. Oh my God. They used to say that al Nawawi, rahimahullah, that al Nawawi rahimahullah, had 12 classes in a day. 12 classes. And when he used to go through the markets, he used to raise his voice with the knowledge that he was reciting. And if he didn't do that, he had to put his fingers in his ears. Otherwise, he would end up memorizing what people said in the markets. Oh, fish fabulous, 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 fish fabulous. Oh my God, he would end up memorizing that. <laughs> okay? Amazing, isn't it? Focus your energies and Allah, Allah will make it possible. Abu Zura, radiallahu anhu, he said, I memorized 200,000 hadith. And he told the son of Imam Ahmed, Abdullah ibn Ahmed, he said, Qara'tu ma'abik min hifdihi. I read from, with your father from his own memory. Alf, alf hadith. What is alf, alf hadith? One million hadith. From the memory of Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, if you want to achieve Jannah, it's not, it's not good enough to just achieve Jannah. Just aim for Jannah. You have to aim for the highest of Jannah. There was a woman who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And her husband, her, her son had passed away. Had passed away in the battle of Badr. And when he had passed away in the battle of Badr, and actually, not actually passed away in the battle of Badr, he was going in the battle of Badr towards the battle of Badr. And then on the way, the camel kicked and he fell, and then he fell over and he broke his neck. 
So the people thought that he was not a shaheed. Why not? He was not a shaheed because, because he actually didn't get to fight. They thought that he actually was not a shaheed because he, his, he died before the battle. So Umm Ayman started crying because all the Sahaba thought he was not a shaheed. Umm Ayman started crying, crying, crying. And she came to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, is my son, where is my son now? He said, Insha'Allah, he is in Jannah. He said, Are you sure in Jannah or just Jannah? So Rasulullah looked at her and said, Ya Waihaki Umm Ayman, Innaha Jinan. He said, What? It's not one Jannah. It's hundreds of Jannahs, hundred levels of Jannah. And your son has achieved the highest one. Al Firdaus Al A'la. You know our problem is we forget Jannah is actually 100 levels. We think it's just Jannah. Oh Allah, let get me into Jannah. That's not good enough. It's Jinan. Does anyone here have his own house? Who has his own house? Anyone? Anyone here has his own house? Not yet? Okay, the government owns everything here, is it? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, anyone has his own car? How about a car? Do you have your own car? Akhi, what car do you drive? Toyota? Vios. Okay. So, Akhi, when you see a Bentley, a Bentley, 500 series, white, pearly white, amazing tires, stops on your side, don't you have that feeling that I wish Allah had given me that? I mean, sometimes you don't. It's like, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, I don't want dunya and whatever else. But, <laughs> but there's always an inkling. Oh, how I wish I had that car. Imagine the levels in Jannah. If you went to one level and the next level, wouldn't you wish that you had that level? You would. There's a second problem that we have. Second problem is we think Jannah is cheap. Jannah is so cheap. It's as cheap as chips, as we say in Australia. Cheap as chips. Yeah, you know, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, that's it. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, that's it. No, it's not. Jannah is very, very expensive. The Prophet ﷺ stood up on his member and he said, Ala inna sila'ata Allahi ghaliya. Ala inna sila'ata Allahi ghaliya. Ala inna sila'ata Allahi ghaliya. Sila'ata Allahi Jannah. What did he say? Is not the prize of Allah expensive? Is not the prize of Allah expensive? Is not the prize of Allah expensive? The prize of Jannah. It's expensive. You can't gain it by sitting on your backside doing nothing, just your job. What the heck are you talking about? You can't gain Jannah just by saying SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. That's it. What are you talking about? Perhaps save yourself from a bit of fire, yes. But no, you can't achieve Jannah like that. Please, don't think Jannah is cheap. Please don't think Jannah is just waiting for you to just open arms as soon as you die. All the malaika, rahmah are coming to you. No, 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 that's not happening. Jannah is expensive. You must pay your mahar now. You must, you want wives in Jannah, pay her mahar now. You want your place in Jannah, pay the rent now. And the purchase price is very easy. It's your life, your time, your money, and your blood, and your sweat, and your tears. Everything. It's very important, my brothers and sisters, Islam, to understand this. Nothing else but pure dedication and focus will get you Jannah. So number two is focus. Number three, he said, is hard work. Ijtihad. You got to work hard. You got to work hard. You got to buy those books. You got to get up in the middle of the night. You have to. You have to study 14 hours a day. There were days in Medina when I used to study 14 hours a day. And you have to study. You have to turn over the books. You have to travel. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to leave your wife behind. You're going to have to leave your family behind. You're gonna have, just, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You're going to have to do it. It just has to be done. Each she hard. Without it, you'll never get knowledge. Do you know this scholar by the name of Abdurrahman bin Al-Qasim, rahimahullah, one of the great students of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he was sitting next to Imam Malik, and then those caravans that come for Umrah, that pass by Makkah and Medina, had come. 
They came past Medina, and a young boy, very, very beautiful, handsome, he came to Imam Malik and said, Ya Imam, Afiku Abdurrahman bin al Qasim? Is that Abdurrahman bin al Qasim amongst you? Yes, yes, Imam Malik said. Here is Abdurrahman bin al Qasim sitting next to me. So the young boy came and he hugged Abdurrahman bin al Qasim and he kissed him. This story is narrated by Al Zahabi in Surah Alam al Nubala. Is narrated that this young boy came and he hugged Abdurrahman bin al Qasim. He kissed him on his forehead and said, Oh, my father, I'm your son. What? And everyone was surprised. I mean, is this a legitimate son? Abdurrahman bin al Qasim? <laughs> so Abdurrahman bin al Qasim goes, No, 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 no. He's very legitimate. But let me tell you the story. 17 years ago, so 17 years old. 17 years ago, when I was in Egypt, I wanted to come to study with Imam Malik. At that time, my wife was pregnant. So I gave her three choices. Either I divorce you, right? Look, he didn't say, what do you think? Hey, wife, what do you think? Would you let me go? No. Okay. My wife says no. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Who is more beloved to you? Allah or your wife? What is more important to you? This dunya or the akhirah? I'm telling you. I'm telling you, this is serious. It's very important. Allah has ordered us to make our akhirah more beloved to us than our own families. And to bring our families with us on our journey. So he gave her three choices. First choice, either I leave you and you can go your way, I go mine. Because there's no compromise. I have to study. That's my life. I want to meet Allah, not an ignorant donkey. I want to go meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a knowledgeable scholar. Fine. Number two. The second option is, either I divorce you so you go your own way. Option number two is either you come with me to Medina. That also she didn't want because she, ha she had a family in Egypt. Option number three is we stay married but you stay here in Egypt and you raise the son and I will try and come back whenever I can. Happy? She chose option number which one? Three. <laughs> she chose option three. And Imam... Abdurrahman bin Qasim said, well, Wallahi, for 17 years, I did not have the opportunity to go back. Every time I wanted to go back, I said, Subhanallah, how can I miss that hadith? How can I miss that class? How can I miss that? Yes, Salam. My brothers, my sisters, Islam, if you've got a text message right now, your wife is going to deliver. Quick, quick, quick. What would you do? Sheikh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone, make dua for me. My wife's delivering. I have to go. And in a state of craziness, you will drive faster than the wind and you reach the main hospital of Singapore to deliver your child. And we won't see you tomorrow, by the way, because you'll be busy with your child. <laughs> the point of the matter is what? point of the matter is, the point of the matter is, where's your focus? I'm not being silly and saying, please don't go and visit your wife. She's delivering. Please do. I'm a medical doctor, I, I expect the father to be there and I usually get angry when the mom is there, when the wife is delivering and the, the, the husband's not there, so where the heck is the husband who made you pregnant? Where is he? <laughs> He's not by your side, so <laughs> fine, I understand. Please go to your wife if they're sick. But the point of the matter is, look at why Imam Abdurrahman bin Qasim was truly an Imam. When Imam Abdurrahman bin Qasim died, they said he was the Imam of the Ahl dunya he was the Imam of Ahl al-Dunya, all of the dunya. Why? Because of sacrifices like this. You don't sacrifice, you don't. It doesn't, there's nothing behind it. And that's why passion comes from the French word passion, which means sacrifice. That you have to sacrifice something in order to achieve something that you truly love. Let me tell you the story of this great scholar who lived in a well for 10 years. He lived in a well. Did you ever hear about a scholar living in a well? But he did. His name was Imam al-Sarakhsi, rahimahullah. Great scholar of the Hanafi Madhab. He wrote a book called Al-Mabsut in 36 volumes. But when you open the book of Mabsut, he didn't write it. You read it, it's like, وَأَمْلَاهُ الشَّيْخِ عَبْدُ الرَّحْمَانِ إِمَامَ al-Sarakhsi مِنْ تَحْتَ الْبُقْعَةِ And this has been narrated by Imam al-Sarakhsi from the bottom of a well whilst he was imprisoned by the Khalifa wrongfully. For 10 years, for 10 years, 
He was imprisoned in the bottom of a well until his feet became gangrenous and they had to cut it, cut it off. He was imprisoned in the bottom of a well and all he would do is recite from his memory and his students would come to the top of the well and write it down. And they made the book on Mabsud 36 volumes. Yes, Salaam. Yes, Salaam. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Why would people do that? There is nothing greater than knowledge. Look at the hard life. Look at the hard work. Nothing greater than knowledge. It was said that al that al zuhri as as al zuhri rahimahullah, al zuhri and al thawri rahimahullah, al thawri rahimahullah was exceptionally poor. That every time he needed pens, he would find which part of the house he could sell. He started selling a brick. Then he started selling a whole wall. Then he started selling which part of the roof can I take? We we'll take this part. And this part of the team, he would take it and he would sell it, and then he would stay on this part because the rain would fall, and he would stay only on this part. Then he started living in a way where only the team would cover him until he was crunched up. Why would he do that? Because he said, when I needed ink, I can't think. I need ink. So he was so poor, he had to sell whatever he had. Yes, salam. My brothers, my sisters, Islam, we are not at that level. MashaAllah, every one of us has pens that we never ever finish. Have you ever finished a pen? Many of us never finished a pen. <laughs> and as and as and our Tawri Rahimahullah always used to finish the pens. Writing, 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 writing. This is what was said about a Tabari Rahimullah when he wrote his original tafsir. It was four hundred volumes. And then they said, Ya Tabari, who is going to read a book of four hundred volumes? So he condensed it into how much? into 40 volumes, and then he cried, and he cried, and he cried, and he said, Dhahab al-ilm, Dhahab al-ilm, knowledge is gone, knowledge is gone. What am, I, what am I gonna condense from 400 volumes to 40 volumes? He cried and he cried. Yes, Salaam. My brothers and sisters, these are not fairy tales, these are true stories. True stories of true scholars, our leaders, that's why Islam was so great. We have forgotten this ijtihad, and by Allah, the only things we make ijtihad about is this dunya these days. <laughs> then Ashafi Rahma continued and he said the fourth thing is what? Bulgha. Oh, that's important. What is bulgha? Money. What? I'm sure a lot of people just looked at me like, what? You need money? Yeah. Shafi said, without money, you can't gain knowledge. You need money. Please don't justify this to me, therefore I need my nine to five job. No, no. You need money. Meaning what? You have to travel. You have to pay for courses. You have to buy books. You have to visit a scholar that is only coming in Mecca for two days in the last days of Ramadan. And if you want to go and ask him a hadith, you have to go there. It's going to cost you money. It's expensive. Even if you're going to stay in Mecca for the last 10 days, it's expensive. Money. You need money in order to gain knowledge. You see how, how practical the advice of Shafi is? You need money to gain knowledge. So where's your money? How much money have you set aside to buy books? How much money have you spent gaining knowledge? Or how much money do you spend now buying a good car? Or buying or going out on a restaurant? How much? So this is a very important point, my brother, sister, sister. Money is very important for gaining knowledge. Then we continue. Number five. We're coming to the end. Number five. What is number five? He said, وَصُحْبَةُ أُسْتَاذٍ Number five, you need a good teacher. You have to find a good teacher to seek knowledge from. By Allah, rain, hail, snow, whatever it is, stick with your teacher. You have to find a good teacher. Don't just seek knowledge for any habdab lab. You know habdab lab means? I don't know, I just made it up. <laughs> okay, don't just seek knowledge from anyone. And any Tom, Dick, and Harry, no, you have to scrutinize what he knows. The Sahaba would come and the Tabi'in would come and they would look at the person praying. Then they would seek knowledge. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, he didn't want to seek knowledge from a, a boy, from a man. Why? Because he saw him misleading the donkey to the water. He's trying to trick the donkey. And said, no, if he's tricking a donkey, he could trick me. I'm a bigger donkey than him. So he said, no. <laughs> Obviously, he was being very, very polite. But the whole point is, he never sought knowledge from him. Seek knowledge from the right people. You know, people come to me, but Abu Yusuf, I read in that book, 
Which book? Uh, I don't remember the name of the book. So who wrote the book? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, so when did you read it? Uh, I don't remember. So you don't remember when you read the book? Who wrote the book? Okay, what the name of the book is? What, <laughs> what are you telling me? No, 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 that book said that this is right. Oh, that's wrong. So you, you, you're kidding me. How can you gain knowledge of that? You don't know from where you got it, who wrote it, where it was written. Oh, I saw in the YouTube video. Who, who, who was the guy speaking? I don't know. I don't know him. What was he saying? I've forgotten. Um, okay, so you've forgotten the title of the video, the guy who said it, what he said, and you're coming to talk to me about some knowledge? Have you, have you ever sat with some friends and they started talking about a fatwa? So no, 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 that's halal, it's halal. What do you mean it's halal? Yeah, yeah, I read it, I read it. Where? You know, I, you know, you know me, right? I know Arabic, right? So please, everyone, I know Arabic. I can speak Arabic, okay, thank you. Right? I can speak Arabic, so I'm not like you all. I understand the Quran when it's read. Alhamdulillah means praise be to Allah. <laughs> I have a lot of people like that, okay? A lot of people like that. You can't gain knowledge like that. You need a teacher. You need a teacher. You can't gain knowledge from books. This is why Abu Hanifa rahimahullah used to say, he used to say, what did he say? He said, the one whose shaykh is his books, his mistakes are many, and his correctedness, and his correct, what he's correcting is a few. The one who makes his shaykh his books, his teacher is his books, his mistakes are far more than what is right about him. Okay? So please don't make this mistake. Don't make the mistake of making your books your teacher, your, your books and your teacher your, your books or the internet or Google or whatever. Don't. Please, please, for Allah's sake, make your teacher a proper teacher in Islam. Stick with him. Learn with him. Learn till you, you cannot learn any more from him and you've exhausted it. It was said that Al-Harbi, rahimahullah, great scholar of Islam, said, I sat with... Uh, Al Hassan for seven years not missing a single day even the day of Eid. Not missing a single day even the day of Eid. It was said that Imam Malik rahimahullah, he sat with his Shaykh. Okay? He sat with his Shaykh, Imam Malik rahimahullah from Nafi. He said he, he sat with his Shaykh. How long? He sat with him for 13 years not missing a single day even the day of Eid. Even the day of Eid. Subhanallah. He was said about al Makwal that he did not miss his shaykh for 20 years, a single class. I remember my own teacher, Shaykh Ahmed Rashid al Ruhayri, he said, I sat with my own teacher for 17 years. I asked him questions and questions and questions, not missing a single class. And he would even go with me to the class of Shaykh Sankrit, I would see him there. And he was my own, own shaykh. He said, this is my shaykh and I've never missed a class with him and never will I ever miss a class until, until I die. How much have you gained knowledge? Do you have a teacher? Have you sat with the teacher? Have you asked the teacher to make him your teacher? Have you told him, Sheikh, I want to learn from you? Have you exhausted everything that he has? Have you forced him to, Sheikh, you must teach me? Do you know, I remember when I went to Medina, a lot of the teachers there are very busy doing PhD, researchers, doing their uh, official roles and jobs at the government, etc. I remember I went to one of them and said, which I wanted to study with, I said, Shaykh, I made a dua to Allah. This is how I coaxed him into teaching me. I said, I made a dua to Allah. So what dua did you make? I said, Shaykh, I said into my dua, in my dua to Allah, Oh Allah, let either of the two most beloved people to you. And I mentioned his name and another Shaykh's name. The one who is most beloved to you, teach me, Ya Allah. And then I cried in my dua. So the Shaykh started crying and said, okay, I'll teach you. So good. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You have to gain knowledge. And you have to stick with the teacher. Wherever the teacher goes, you have to take everything from it. I remember asking my own chef more than a thousand questions in Islam. I sat with my chef for more than 4,000 hours in classes with him. If you don't sit for classes, how in the world? What knowledge have you gained? So my brothers and my sisters in Islam, I hope everyone amongst us is feeling like, what in the world is this? And where are we from gaining knowledge? I hope you're feeling that. And that is called regret. Regret's very important. But that's the first part of actually making change. If you don't even have regret, 
than by Allah or regret about what I've done in my past life or how little knowledge I know, then that's a big mushkila. But if you have regret and you ask Allah for help, then inshaAllah ta'ala, the last part of the advice of Shafi will come to, which is what? So first he said is, what did he say? What, what's the first one? Intelligence. Number two is? Focus. Number three is? What is it? Hard work. Number four is? Money. Number five is? Companionship of a teacher. Number six is? What is number six? Oh, I didn't explain it. Okay, number six is Tulu Zamani. Long duration of study. Long duration of study. You can't gain knowledge in just two days. You can't gain knowledge just, just, you know, dribs and drabs and here and there. You can't. You need a long duration knowledge. And that's very, very critical, right? Very critical. It's a long, lifelong journey. It's a lifelong journey. You must gain knowledge every day. You must seek knowledge every day. You know, so serious was some of the scholars about gaining knowledge. Right? So serious were they about gaining knowledge. Like Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah, it was reported that he was so serious about sticking to a sheikh and gaining knowledge as much as possible for Ibn Taymiyyah, that when Ibn Taymiyyah would be put in prison, why would he be put in prison? Because he made a fatwa which a khalifa didn't like, so put him in prison. Anyway, so when they put him in prison, Ibn Qayyim said, I used to beg the guards of the prison, please, enter me into prison so I can sit with my sheikh. He used to beg the prison guards until he said, may Allah forgive me, I bribed them once. And then on, once I bribed them, they put me in prison with my sheikh, alhamdulillah. I stayed with him for six months seeking knowledge. What the? Unbelievable, isn't it? You see, when someone loves knowledge, this is like drugs. It's the only thing that keeps his heart beating. It's the only thing that he thinks about. It's the only thing that gives him satisfaction. It's the only thing that he actually loves and likes. Only nutrition that he ever needs. I'm telling you, I urge my brothers, my sisters in Islam, all of you, all of you, together, to seek a path to gaining knowledge and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala share with you this beautiful joy and this enjoyment. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your path to, to, uh, to gaining knowledge easy for you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you good teachers and keep you upon the right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. And remember, remember what the Sahaba used to say. Whoever thinks gaining knowledge is not tantamount to fighting and struggling in the cause of Allah, then he has a deficiency in his mind. So therefore today in the 21st century, the real struggle, the real struggle is not on the battlefield. The real struggle is gaining knowledge. How far is the ummah away from knowledge today? Do you know how many libraries there are in Egypt today? Public libraries? How many? How many, everyone? How many? Nothing. None. No public libraries. Even Azhar, you need to show your card. <laughs> so there's no real public libraries. You can just go there and study, but you can't borrow a book. No public libraries. In Australia, my grandma borrows books from the library. Oh my God. Do you know what I'm saying? My little kids can borrow, you know, uh, Baba Black Sheep from the library. They can borrow, you know what I'm saying? How far are we from knowledge? We're so far away. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this ummah to become an ummah of knowledge, the ummah of, uh, of the Quran, uh, the ummah of uh, the greatest miracle of Rasulullah Sallallahu which is the knowledge they left behind. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you all in levels and give you the highest of Jannah, inshaAllah. <laughs> Right. Anyone has any questions at all? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to accept questions uh, via slips of paper. Uh, and also, I think we've got some microphones to be circulated. Micro no microphones. Micro okay, so I already have the first question. Okay. Uh, can you all hear me? <coughs> Just loud enough? Okay. So, what is the difference between them and us. I think them means to people of the past, the, the scholars of the past. Okay. Such that they can achieve so much when it comes to zeal and thirst for knowledge. And we now are struggling to even get started or keep at it. Yeah. It's a good question. I think my brothers, this is Islam, <clears throat> it's all about your priorities. 
It's all about your priorities and what is the priority for you and your life. What is the priority for you? Is the priority for you a good life in this dunya at the expense of the akhirah? Or is the priority for you the best life that you can get in the akhirah? What is the priority for you? That you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most that you can? Or that you just please Allah as much as you can and everyone else you please them more? What is the priority for you? That you do the best that you can in this dunya or that you do the best that you can for the akhirah? What is your priority? It's just about your priorities. Prioritize your priorities. And every one of us, we, we will live for at least 60 or 70 years. Vast majority of us. That's the hadith of Rasulullah My ummah will live for 60 or 70 years. This is not me saying it. My prophet said it. So if this is the case that we'll live for 60 or 70 years, what is our priority in these 60 or 70 years of our life? What is our priority? Is our priority raising good children? Is our priority having a good home? Is our priority building a house? I remember my parents, their priority was to build a home back in Bangladesh. That was their priority first. That's why they would save up money and the most important thing that they would do was straight away take that money and buy land in Bangladesh and build their first home. They saw this as such a great achievement. When they built their first home, they said, ah, oh, my heart is so much at peace. So what is your priority? Ask yourself what's your, what your priority is. Is your priority marrying a really, really beautiful wife? Beautiful girl? What is your priority? It's about prioritizing your priorities, my brothers and sisters in Islam. When you prioritize your priorities, you know exactly what you need to do. If you know your priority is gaining knowledge, and that is the most important thing, it doesn't matter what else you do. I remember when I was 17 or 18, 17 years old, I wasn't practicing. I was actually practically a disbeliever, practically an atheist at that point. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me, alhamdulillah. In my first year of medicine in, in University of, of, of Melbourne, in Melbourne University, I remember that's when I actually started to practice and learn about Islam. Then my priorities changed. My priority wasn't to be a great doctor anymore. My priority was to know Allah Azawajal. I remember my second year and third year when I would be grabbing the books of anatomy and physiology and pathology or clinical medicine. Instead of that, and I had a choice between that and Bukhari, which one would I pick? Ah, uh, you know what, exams tomorrow, no worries. It's already written what's going to happen, so I'll just pick Bukhari. So I <laughs> it was written, alhamdulillah, passed. The point of the matter is, it's all about your priorities. In the fourth year of medicine, I decided to leave medicine. I said, that's it. I'm not going to study. I'm going to study Islam. So people thought I was mad. And you think that someone who got into the highest degree in, in university... Uh, Melbourne University was the best university in Australia and medicine was the most difficult to get into. You needed 99.85 as a mark to get in. And that's the mark that I got, alhamdulillah. So they said that it would be madness to leave. And I remember the whole community was saying, this is mad. The guy's mad. He's become mad. Someone's made him mad. Of course, mad. Mad with love for Islam. Mad. Absolutely mad. I remember... The first, <laughs> I got into the plane and the first place I went to was, was Singapore. Because the flight was going to take me via Singapore to Saudi. When I got down from the plane, I know my mom was angry at me. But I still had to study. The first place I went to was Little India. And opposite that masjid of Little India, there was a restaurant there. Me and, me and a friend of mine, we had chapati, roti chanai there, right? And subhanAllah, I, th I think it was a very bad roti chanai. <laughs> or it was the curse of my mama, whatever it was. And the Singapore Airlines flight was delayed that day. They made me stay one day in Singapore. I said, that's it, yes, salam. Uh, Allah's going Allah's to gonna destroy me. Yeah, Allah, forgive me somehow. <laughs> my mom's making dua. My dad's making dua. Don't let him do it. But I persisted, persevered. I went and I studied. Then I came back and I finished my medicine again. Alhamdulillah. It's prioritizing your priorities. It's unheard of. Medical school does not accept the same guy twice. But I said, Bismillah, tawakkal to Allah. I wrote it and I was the first person accepted when I came back. You know what? Prioritize your priorities. But Allah, you'll get everything you want in this dunya. You'll get everything. You'll get your money, you'll get your wife, you'll get your Bentley as well. <laughs> Eventually. Okay. <laughs> you might only be able to enjoy it for a few years, but you will still get it. <laughs> But prioritize your priorities and Allah will give you everything in this dunya and the akhirah, inshaAllah.
So uh, the next question is, um, how to know if the knowledge we're gaining or learning is the right one? Uh, how do you know if the knowledge that you're gaining is the right one? Okay, knowledge is what Allah has said and what His Messenger has said. Everything else is not knowledge, it's just opinion. It's true, isn't it? Al-ilm ma qala Allah qala Rasul. غير ذلك كله يعني بس كلام أراء الناس. Yeah. So we can learn about so many different things in our in our life. We can learn about a whole matter. For example, I studied the Hanbali matter in detail from A to Z. Right. But that is not really knowledge. What's knowledge is what that is based on. Ah. Uh, so Imam Ahmed said this, but he based that on this verse, or he based that on this this hadith. Oh, okay, that's knowledge. Does that make sense, everybody? So it's not important what a sheikh said or what an imam said. What's important is what he based it on. Does that make sense, everyone? So how do you know if a knowledge is right or wrong? That knowledge which focuses on the Qur'an and teaching you the statements of the Prophet ﷺ, that is knowledge. I remember when Abdul Razak, Abdul uh, 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 Abd uh, Abdul Razak al-Afifi, I believe that's his name. He was a mufti of Egypt, of Ansar al-Sunnah. He was the head of Ansar al-Sunnah. When he was asked by Sheikh bin Baz, rahimullah, to come to, to Saudi Arabia to be part of the Lejna Daima, which was the first committee of the major scholars of Saudi Arabia at that time that was being set up under bin Baz. And he made him the Naib mufti. He made him the vice, vice mufti. He gave him uh, al-Muqni'. What's, what's al-Muqni'? Muqni is one of the main books about the Hanbali Madhab, right? About the opinions of the Hanbali Madhab. He read the whole book. He read the whole book, about four volumes. And Sheikh bin Baz said, how did you find it? How did you find the book? Because he wanted him to give opinions according to that, because the king had ruled that Saudi Arabia would be according to the Hanbali Madhab, right? So he said, yeah, it's an okay book, but in all of the four volumes, he hasn't mentioned a single hadith or a verse of the Quran. Ooh. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. What is knowledge and what is not knowledge is known by the source, the true source of knowledge, and that is Quran and Sunnah. Everything else is inconsequential. Everything else is ara and nas. Yeah? Everything else is just opinion. And you're not a knowledgeable person if you know the Hanbali, Hanbali Madhab, or Hanafi Madhab, or Maliki, Shafi Madhab. No, 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 you're just knowledgeable about opinions. You're a very knowledgeable about opinions person. <laughs> okay? But if you want to be an alim, then what is that based on? Where does it come from? What verse of the Quran? What sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? That is what true knowledge is, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, the next question is, um, you mentioned that you asked your well, shaykh a lot of questions. We also have lots of questions, but there's a hadith, quote unquote, don't argue about me. I am confused. Uh, there's nothing to be confused about. Everything is clear. The Quran is clear. Sunnah is clear. Thank you. <laughs> no, nothing to be confused about. The hadith of Rasulullah about not asking too many questions is not now. It's limited to the time or revelation. It's not for now. Now you should be asking a thousand one questions, hundred thousand questions. Just keep asking. Ask the right people, but okay. Ask the people that are worthy of questions. How do you know who's worthy of a question? Well, first of all, a person has to have clear knowledge. So it must be a, a person knowledgeable in that particular topic. Number two, that person must refer to the true sources of knowledge, Quran and Sunnah, in order to give you the knowledge. Number three, make sure that that person, if you're asking about a particular specific issue, let's say about Singapore, then he has knowledge about Singapore. You shouldn't be asking me with all due respect about some fiqh issue regarding somewhere in Singapore about this thing happening, about what is the ruling regarding chewing gum in Singapore. I thought, why are you asking me about that? I don't even know what the rule in Singapore is about chewing gum. I was told that chewing gum is only prescription. Chewing gum. Is that right? It's prescription. It's very important, by the way. Saliva is very important for your mouth. It's what makes sure that your mouth doesn't, uh, your teeth doesn't decay. So keep, keep chewing. I mean, not chewing gum, but keep chewing like, yeah, that's it. Produce saliva. It's good for your teeth. But anyway, coming back to, uh, to <laughs> non-medical issues. Non-medical issues. Uh, 
You shouldn't be asking me about that which is specific to Singapore when I don't have any knowledge about Singapore. If I've lived here for what, a couple of months and I understand the culture, the people, understand the community, understand the laws, then I can give you an opinion perhaps that might be valid. I remember when our Sheikh, when the tsunami happened, remember the tsunami in 2004? And Boxing Day in, 2000, in, in the 26th of December, uh, the tsunami, the great tsunami that happened, uh, the people from Sri Lanka called me on the phone and said, Sheikh, we've got these, these sisters whose husbands were washed away and they're still at sea or their bodies have died. We don't know where they are. We just haven't found their bodies yet. So the sisters are asking, when does their Iddat al-Mutawaffa begin? What is Iddat al-Mutawaffa meaning? The Iddat, the waiting period for their husbands after they have died. You know there's a waiting period if your husbands die. When does it begin? Is it from the day of the tsunami or from now or from when? So I remember calling my sheikh and saying, Sheikh, uh, this su'al, what should we say? We know in the Maliki Madhab it says five years. Wait till five years from the date of them being lost. We know in the Hanafi Madhab it says three. We know the Hanbali says four. What do we do? And of course, none of them are based on any strong proof or evidence. It's just, uh, uh, just Ara and Nas really. So... What do we really, what do we do? The Shaykh told me categorically, do not answer that opinion. He said, Wallahi, even I should not answer that opinion. So really? So yes, because we don't know exactly how much searching has happened. We don't know when the authorities will declare that the search will finish, right? We can't. So it's up to the local authorities when they declare that the search is finished, that everyone else therefore who is not accounted for is, is going to be declared to be dead. Could be after a year, could be a year and a half, whatever it is. Because the whole process of matching up, people were displaced everywhere, isn't it? So at the end of the day, our Sheikh said, do not answer the question. Wallahi, I learned a lesson that day. And that day, the lesson I learned is, doesn't matter how knowledgeable about Islam you are, you also need to know about local circumstances. Which also means something else, very important. And that is, the community must invest in local scholars. If you don't have local scholars here who can give you answers, according to Quran and Sunnah, that are knowledgeable, and also know local circumstances, how would you have answers to your to your, to your problems. Who will you ask? Who will you seek knowledge from? So you must invest in the best of the ulama worldwide to bring them here, to keep them here, to let them live here so they can understand the circumstances and then give you the opinion according to that. Does that make sense, everybody? Very important. Don't go to fatwa websites. Okay, and try to learn Islam through that. It's good to just learn about basic things. What's the ruling of salah in Islam? Wajib. Good. Whoa. What are the things that break your wudu? Okay? It's good to learn those things from fatwa websites. But don't learn fatwa about something specific to Singapore from fatwa websites. This is ridiculous. They could be the greatest muftis in the world, but they have no knowledge about Singapore unless they are a mufti from Singapore that gave that fatwa. Does that make sense, everybody? It's very important to realize this, inshallah.